tonight we're going to be talking about this kind of faith that only stirs up in moments like these. When you don't know where else to go, when you don't know what else to do, you'll begin to tap into something called a desperate faith. There are some people that may not know what that looks like because they've never been through what you've been through. You've been in situations that have backed you into a corner, that have forced you to rely on nothing else except this desperate faith in the Lord. Some people don't have the same type of battle scars that you have on your life right now. Some people don't have the same type of story that you have. They weren't brought up the same way. Some people may have been spoon-fed their whole life and lived in a fantasy world. That's okay. We're, we're not going to judge them. Some people may not have a story quite like yours that have forced you to go into a place of desperate faith. But we should not forget what got you to that point. Your faith went through some serious tests. How many know what I'm talking about? Your faith went through some serious tests to get you to that level of desperate faith. It went through some serious trials and some serious battles to get you to this point that you're at right now. Everybody, all of us have been given some measure of faith, but desperate faith must be developed. A deep faith must grow. Today, I want to teach you how desperate times birth desperate faith. Say that with me. Say desperate times birth desperate faith. Now, when we look at this scripture, we can see that there are different stages where someone's faith begins to develop. Now, the Bible teaches us that all of us have been given some measure of faith. So at everyone's starting point, we've been given faith. What is faith? It's believing for something that you can't see. If you want to sum it up, that's the easiest way to sum it up. Faith for something you can't see. Believing God for something. And many of us have been believing God for things. We believe God for our salvation. We believe God for breakthrough. We believe God for a healing but everyone's faith goes through rigorous tests and trials only to develop it, to get to the next stage and the next stage, eventually getting us to this desperate faith. And the first stage that I think all of us are in when we have this type of faith is stage number one, the ask. Someone say the ask. Ask with a K, just making sure. Verse 18, going back to that scripture, in Judges 20, verse 18, it says, then the Israelites marched up to Bethel to ask for direction from God. Anyone ever stopped on a road trip to ask for direction? Uh, excuse me, you know where I'm at? Or do you know where I happen to be? Um, I'm kind of, I'm looking for um, brown sugar. Do you have brown sugar? What aisle is that in? If you could just point the way. They inquired, the scripture says, inquired, said, who should go up first to fight against the Benjaminites for us? I love that. I think that's so funny I, uh, that, that, that the people of God were inquiring, inquiring to God. And the word inquire literally means just to look into, to look into something. I, I'm kind of looking into it. I'm doing a little research just to get a little information. Anyone ever inquired on like a nice house you saw? You're like, I just want to, is there an open house coming up? Or uh, how, many, how many beds and baths? How many square footage? I'm just inquiring. Are you guys hiring right now? Because I just want to drop off my application. Just inquiring, no real expectation. I just want to ask. Our faith kind of starts in this place. Our faith starts in this, this ask place, this inquiry mode. It's a place where we're just kind of lightly getting information from God. We kind of tap in and we check in with the Lord to make sure that we're just running our plans by him. 
I hope this is cool. Just going to check in with you, God. I just want to run it by you, make sure it's cool. But I already got my heart set on this. I'm just inquiring. The problem is we can't win a spiritual war with an inquire faith. See, the type of fight we're in right now is not something for the lighthearted. The type of faith we're in, we know it's not something just for, just for anybody. We're talking about a real spiritual fight for your soul. And you know all the plans and the tactics that the enemy has thrown your way to capture your soul. He's thrown drugs your way. He's thrown sexual morality your way. He's thrown violence your way. He's thrown unforgiveness your way. He's thrown anger your way. I, I'm just naming off a few things and, and, and I think we're probably covered about 99.9% .9 of people in this room, including myself. The 0.1%, that's Jesus. He's sitting right over here. He, this faith, this inquire faith can't get us through these spiritual warfare and the spiritual battles that we're facing today. We're in a real life spiritual war for our souls that we cannot bring an inquire faith. Just kind of lightly asking, just kind of checking in with you, God. Um, you know, if you can kind of get me through this, that'd be cool. I, 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 that's not the kind of faith that, that, that gets, that helps. You know, when I think of an inquired faith and, and I think of the battles that we're facing today, I just, I just can't help but think that, that, that God must be doing, must be doing, trying to do something deeper within us, that there must be more than just a, a shallow level of faith that we're just dipping our toe in. I, I think that God must be doing something to really snatch our heart and to stir our faith up, to really believe that there is more than just the shallow end of the pool. That God has something deeper and greater in store for you and I. And it doesn't just have to settle with what you see right now. And God is saying it's time to go to the next level of your faith. It's time to develop a desperate faith in me. So I have this inquire faith. They're, they're just kind of running it by God. But we need to let our faith grow past the ask. Let your faith grow past that. What do I mean by that? Let me bring it into to a real life situation. Have you ever asked God for something and it turned out completely opposite of the way you thought it was going to turn out? You ask the Lord for something and, and uh, you know, you're just, maybe a better question to ask is, have you ever asked God for something and it turned out 100% like you thought it would work out? Probably not. God knows what he's doing. God knows exactly what he's doing. I remember when I was in, in, in high school was when, I, when God first began to show me, and I believe God first began to tell me and call me to be a pastor. And, and, and I, I started to believe that. I started to walk in it. So I'm thinking I needed to, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm like, Lord, what, what do I need to do? Help me to become a pastor. Help me to become a, a man of God. Help me, and I'm thinking I just got to be a good preacher. That, that's, and that's like, 5% of what it means to be a pastor is, and so I'm thinking, oh, I know exactly how it's going to work out. And you want to know what's so funny, what the Lord showed me in that moment? One of the first things God told me when I found out I was called to be a pastor was do your homework. Do your homework? That don't sound very holy. That sounds demonic. <laughs> I don't know about that. One of the first things God told me was the way you treat your homework is the way you're going to treat your ministry. I said, oh, oh, I get it now. You know, all God was trying to teach a little, a little, a little high school kid that didn't know what he was doing. That was, was, the head was a little too big for his body and just didn't have it all together. You know what he's trying to teach him? He was trying to teach him that he was trying to teach him this principle. If you're faithful with little, I can entrust you with much. If you're faithful in these little things, I can entrust you with more. So my ask was, Lord, help me to become a great pastor. And God said, do your homework. I'm thinking, that don't make no sense. What does chemistry homework have to do with being a pastor? I don't know. But God knew. 
And why do I say that funny story? Because a lot of times when we're asking God for something, we don't realize that God's already setting us up for that breakthrough. And sometimes he does that and he challenges us and he causes, causes, calls us to go deeper into our faith and calls us to jump in a little further into our walk and maybe make some commitment to grow and maybe jump into that class that we keep talking about, growth track. They keep saying growth track over and over. I don't think that's for me. God, I'm called to be a pastor, but I'm definitely not called to grow spiritually. Maybe sometimes the signs are just so clear, they're right in front of us, but we're ignoring it because we think it's going to happen our way. And what God is saying is, I just need to get you out of, I need to get your faith beyond this. I need to get your faith past this shallow mode because if all I did was just say yes, 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 yes to you, then where would your faith be? It would be about an inch deep. And God is saying, I need to, I just need to pull out some deeper faith within you. I just need you to cry out. I just need you to reach out. I need you to seek me a little deeper. I need you to know that it is not what you do. It's not your talent. It's not your gift. It's not your position. It's not how good looking you are. It's not how, how much your, your credit score looks like, but it's my power. It's my anointing. It's my word. It's my favor on your life that's going to get you there. It's when you put your faith in him. We even got to hold on, even if it doesn't happen right away. They go up, they inquire, Lord, just want to check in with you. Should we go fight the Benjaminites? We're all lined up, ready to go. Just wanted to run it by you real quick. Are we good to go? They're, I think they're heading out. You guys heading out already? They're heading out already. Just letting you know. Uh, give us favor and anointing over there, but we're going to be on our way. And then what happens? Verse 19, the next morning, Israelites got up and camped near Gibeah. They marched out to fight against the Benjaminites, lining up in battle formation against Gibeah. But the Benjaminites marched out from Gibeah and cut down 22,000 Israelite men that day. Talk about not turning out the way you thought it would. The question is, are you going to hold on even if it doesn't look or start turning out the way you thought it would? See, the kind of faith we need as a church today, especially in our world today, is a kind of faith that's willing to endure when it doesn't look like it's going to pan out the way you thought it was. <clears throat> remember the year 2020? We're all trying to forget that year, but you remember that year? <clears throat> Everyone started this year off. This is my year. It's a new decade, 2020 vision. We're going to get it this year. And then, well, I didn't even got to say it. You know what happened. It just didn't turn out the way you thought it would. But are you going to hold on? Are you going to endure? Are you going to stick with the vision that God has given you, even if it's not looking the way you wanted it to look? I wonder if we would stick with the God who does it his way rather than our way. And that's a challenging thing, I think, for a lot of us, Pastor Rob, because, especially because we, we want it our way. I haven't been to Burger King in a long time, but I want it my way. So, you know what I'm talking about? But are we, are we willing to stick with God when he does it his way? Man, I, I hope, I hope I'm, are we getting this tonight? Look at Matthew 7, 7. It says, keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. See, death, desperate faith requires some endurance. What good is faith if it gives up after a little resistance? What good is faith if we just, if we stop at the first sign of an obstacle and we don't keep on asking, we don't keep on seeking, we don't keep on showing up to church, we don't keep on showing up to our power 12, we don't, we, we clock right out the moment we hear or face something that doesn't tickle our ears a little bit. Don't stop when you get hit. Don't stop when the devil tries to punch you back. Don't stop when it doesn't go your way. Don't stop. It's funny, there's a story that um, one of the young adults reminded me about Diego Reyes, where he's in the building somewhere. Awesome man of God. If you don't know who Diego is, you'll find out soon enough. He's a powerful man of God. He preached a message at a young adult service 
on Friday nights at 7. If you're a young adult, show up Friday nights at 7 p.m. They're fire. He preached a fire word. And he brought up this story. Uh, he brought up a story actually about me. It was a funny story. And he was talking about a time I had, I had mentioned to him, a time in my life where I felt like the enemy was just hitting me over and over and over and over. And I felt like, I felt like I just couldn't get it all together. I was crying out to God and, and it was just, it was a hard season in my life. And, and, and I felt like the enemy gave me a blow. And so what did I do? I remember, I think it was in high school. It was like, it was like a, one of our, our breaks. And I got in my, I said, you know what? I'm so upset at the devil. I'm so upset that he keeps trying, he keeps thinking he can just, he can just hit me without getting hit back. I'm, I'm tired of just letting the enemy uh, 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 just take, it, take advantage and do what he wants to do. That's not going to happen anymore. I'm no longer going to let the enemy hit me without me hitting him square in the face. So what did I do? I, I got my Bible. This is like a Tuesday afternoon. I don't even know what day it is. I got my Bible. I jumped in my car. I drove to the mall and I found people to witness to. I'm driving to the mall thinking, what am I doing? This is silly. I go into the mall thinking, okay, now I'm a little nervous. And I just start talking to random people. I find a guy sitting by himself. He's got this big leather jacket on, some big biker dude, and he's, he's biking. And, and I go and I sit down. I just start talking to him. I don't even know how to approach a guy like that. What's up? Hey, what you, what you eating? That's cool. <laughs> I don't even know what I said. I just, but I start talking to him. And I, and I, I just sit down with him. We start having a conversation and I talk to him about the love of Jesus. And I just, I tell him, you know, God loves you so much. You know, that God has a purpose for your life. You know, that God, even though you may not want him, even though you feel like you've messed up too much, he still loves you. And he wants to set you free. He wants to live in your heart. He wants to forgive you of your sin. He desires to show you mercy and grace today. You know what this guy tells me? He says, I don't know why I'm here at this mall. I live over an hour away. Something told me, just go to that mall. I shouldn't even be out in this area. I don't know this area. I'm not from here. But something brought me all the way out here today. And I think it was for this. He gave his life to the Lord at that mall that day. I don't know where he's at. I don't know what's going on with him. But that day forward, I learned something. I am not going to let the devil try to push me around without me punching back. And if the devil thinks he can try to hit, hurt, hit me, I'm going to hit him back. I'm going to go win some souls for the Lord. I'm going to go preach the gospel. I'm going to let somebody know about the mercy, the forgiveness, the love of God, that what he did for me, he can do for somebody else. Come on. We need some radical, desperate people in this place that are not afraid to have some desperate faith. So after this first stage, how does my faith begin to grow? How do I get past just the ask, the inquiry phase? Stage number two is the cry. Someone say the cry. Verse 22 says, but the Israelites encourage each other. And they took their positions again at the same place. That's a word right there. The Israelites got back into position. Someone say get back in position. I don't know what kind of fall you had. I don't know how hard it hurt. I don't know how many people you felt like you disappointed. I don't know how, you, how disappointed you may have felt in yourself. But I'm here to let you know. The word of God is not to run away. The word of God is to get back in position, to get back to that place, to jump back to the arms of God, to jump back into his love and let him heal you and forgive you and give you a brand new start in Jesus' name. Desperate faith develops when you get back in position after you take a hard hit. I don't know, I don't know everyone in here personally, but I can say this with certainty 
that you haven't been perfect. And as a result, you probably have thought about giving up or quitting or turning around and going in the opposite direction. But you're here now. You made it tonight. You entered these doors, you sat down in here, you're watching online right now, and you're hearing this message, and I know, I'm here to let you know, you did the right thing by being here tonight. Desperate faith doesn't develop in perfect people. It develops in people that get back in position, even after they stumble a little bit. Am I talking to anybody in here who, who maybe had a little mess up or two, who maybe got a little dirty, who maybe had a slip up, who maybe did something they're ashamed of, but they're saying, I'm getting back to the feet of God. I'm jumping back to the cross. I'm giving my heart back to Jesus, and I am not done yet, because I know that God is not done with me yet. Come on, I'm not, I know I'm not talking to a room full of perfect people who got it all together. I'm talking to a room full of people that know they need Jesus, that they need forgiveness, they need healing, they need his power, they need breakthrough, they need his love in their life. Uh, woo. Just imagine the Israelites in this moment. They lost 22,000 men and they get back not just in the same position, lining up in the same way, but in the same place, the scripture says. The same place. It wasn't weeks before, it was the day before. I'm sure that there was not a lot of cleanup happening. They're looking right now at their dead brothers out right here in the army, and they can see their, their dead friends, and they're getting right back into that place in the, in the battlefield. Going back to face the same test, the same demon that tried to take you out, mustering up the confidence to go to war once again, even though you took a blow. But I got good news. Proverbs 24, 16 says, the godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. They will get up again. Someone say this with me. Say, get up again. Get up again. Don't, stay down. Don't stay down. See, the cry began to develop at this moment in the people of God. Their faith went from one level of just an inquiry to now they started to muster up and develop a cry within their spirit. And it says in the next verse, in verse uh, 23, they got up to Bethel and wept in the presence of the Lord until evening. They wept they wept. Have you ever been in a place like that where you wept before the Lord? Have you ever faced such a pain that, 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 muster, that forced you to muster a cry from your heart to God? There was a time, it was while I was a student in college. This was a very dark season of my life. I felt lost. I felt like I abandoned God, abandoned my call. I went to school to study ministry, to become a pastor. And I felt like I, I had no relationship with God. I remember one night I was working, I was working a night shift. We're closing up the store and in the middle of my shift, I cry out to God. In the middle, in the middle of work, I'm crying out to the Lord. I'm saying, God, I need you. I don't know what to do. I'm sorry. My eyes are welling up with tears. My coworkers, I'm just, I'm, I'm not showing my face to them. I just, there's a cry in my heart. So after we're closing, at this time I worked at Coffee Bean. Shout out to Coffee Bean. Love Coffee Bean. I'm team Coffee Bean, not team Starbucks. Sorry. In this time, we're closing up the store and lo and behold, a pastor a pastor comes to the window. And mind you, we're already closed. A pastor comes to the window and, and I instantly think, God, is this you? So the pastor comes to the window. There was something I think he forgot or there were some donations he was picking up. And I, I could just feel my hands trembling, realizing that God heard my cry. He heard me, and he responded so quickly. 
I'm giving him the donations in the window. My hands are shaking. I'm looking at him with a blank stare. And no words come out. He looks at me like, all right, bro, thank you. (laughs) I chickened out. I didn't tell him that I just prayed. I didn't tell him that I just cried out to God. I didn't tell him that he was an answer to my prayer. I just let him go. He left. I felt even worse. I'm crying out to God again. God, I'm sorry. If that was really you, just do something. He ends up calling the store. (laughs) After hours. And if you've ever worked in like the fast food places, you don't answer the phone after hours. We're closed, sorry. Tough look. But I grabbed that phone and I just have this hunch in my spirit. I answer the phone. Sure enough, it's him. It's the pastor. I don't remember why he called. I know, I know why he called. I don't remember what his reason was. But I tell him, I just got done praying and asking God for some help. And I know he sent you. And he begins, he begins to speak life into me in that moment. He begins to encourage me. He begins to, sh- uh, to share the word with me and, to, and to, sh- to just to tell me and remind me how good God is and how faithful he is and how merciful he is. And, and he begins to remind me that the goodness of God, that his grace is sufficient, that it's more than I could ever need. And in that moment, I realized something, that God responds to people's cries. God responds to a genuine cry from, the, from your heart. And if you feel like you're in a place right now where you have nothing to give God except the cry, believe me that's more than enough to get capture God's attention in this moment tonight you have a cry in your heart he will respond to you and he will respond quickly Psalms 145 18 says the Lord is near to all who call on him to all who call on him in truth the cry comes out when I was struggling to win but I couldn't and I realized that I needed God None of your cries are in vain. They're heard by God. And after we begin to cry out to the Lord, as we begin to muster up that courage to cry out to the Lord, even though it may not turn out the way you thought it would. So in verse, 20, verse 25, it says that the men of Benjamin killed another 18,000 Israelites. Another blow? God, I cried out to you, why another blow? Why another hit? But in that moment, as you hold on to the Lord, as you hold on to his love, you'll begin to develop such a faith within you that no demon, no storm, no trial, no obstacle, nothing could ever take you out. A desperate faith. And in stage three, a faith that begins to develop. The the third stage is in the surrender. Someone say the surrender. Verse 26. Judges 20, 26. Then all the Israelite troops went back up to Bethel and wept. Just sitting there in the Lord's presence. They fasted that whole day until evening. Then they offered entirely burned offerings and well-being sacrifices to the Lord. The Israelites, they asked the Lord one last time, should we march out once again to fight our relatives or should we just give up? And the Lord replied, march up for I'll hand them to you tomorrow. See, I know it may look like after they wept, after they sat in the presence, after they fasted, after they brought offerings, and after they, they gave sacrifices. I know it sounds like I, that you have to purchase your breakthrough, but they, I don't want anyone to get this confused. They didn't purchase their breakthrough. They were postured for their breakthrough. 
They were in position for their breakthrough. I'm going to say that again, just in case you missed it. They didn't purchase their breakthrough. They were postured for their breakthrough. Their heart was finally in the right place, ready for their breakthrough. Uh, they, they were ready. Their faith became so desperate, so desperate to the point that they were willing to surrender even the victory of the war just to have God. They said this, should we just give up? Should we just let this go? As long as that's your way, Lord, I'm willing to go that route. I wonder how many breakthroughs are waiting to be released in your life, but they're just, God is just waiting for your heart to be postured and in the right position and ready and surrendered and willing to give up everything for him. The people of God in this moment didn't buy anything. They gave up everything to the Lord. The same way Jesus gave up everything for us. The same way that Jesus surrendered his, even his own life on the cross so that we can be saved, healed, and set free. They wept, they fasted. The only posture that's prepared for this kind of breakthrough is in the surrender. I wonder what battles do you have to keep facing until you finally surrender? How many times do we have to face it until we finally wave the white flag to the Lord and say, I'm done. I give up. I'm done running. I'm done fighting. I'm done holding on to this. I'm done living in my mess. I'm, I'm done living this way. I'm done living a lie. I know it's a lie and I'm done believing the lie. I'm done. I'm done with my old ways. I'm done believing what I used to believe. I'm done being stuck here. I'm done feeling disappointed in myself. I'm done letting you down. I'm done, Lord. I'm done. I'm done. I surrender. I give it all up. I give it all up. I give it all to you. I don't need that anymore. I don't need them anymore. I don't need these drugs anymore. I don't need these people. I don't need these things. God, I just need you I give you my dreams I give you my aspirations I give you my heart I give you my ministry I give you my thoughts I give you my I give you everything I give you my sin I give you my good I give you my bad I give you my future I give you everything God even if it's just you it's more than enough for me even if it's just you God that's more than enough for me I surrender everything I surrender everything Lord I surrender it all I surrender everything to you Father Father, it's all yours, God. It belongs to you. It belongs to you, Jesus. It belongs to you, Jesus. It belongs to you, Jesus. If that's you, stand on your feet tonight. It belongs to you, Jesus. It belongs to you. It's all yours, God. Not my will. Not my way. Not what I want. But what you want. My faith, Lord. I'm so desperate, God, that I'll give everything. I'll give it all to you. I'm desperate, Lord. I'm hungry. I'm ready to give it all up. Are you ready? Are you ready? Last verse. Psalms 50, 15. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Wonder how many of us tonight forgot that God works best with our weaknesses. Wonder how many people in here tonight need to know this. That his grace is sufficient, which means his love, his mercy, his grace is more than enough. There's nothing you have to add to it. There's no behavior you have to change before you come to the Lord. There's no mindset you have to change. There's no thing you have to throw away before coming to him. He's saying, my grace is enough. Just bring it to me. Trust me come so desperate that you're willing to give everything to the Lord tonight. God specializes in dead situations. His expertise is dead bones. You felt like you had dead bones, a dead situation, a dead life, dead vision, a dead passion, a dead ministry, a dead fire, 
a dead hunger, if you felt like these things were dead, well, I'm here to give you good news. God specializes in the dead things and bringing dead things to life. I wanna ask you, are you ready to surrender everything? Are you ready to surrender it all? With every head bowed and every eyes closed. If you're ready to surrender everything tonight, if you're ready to give the Lord everything, when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three, raise your hands all over this room. All over this room, hands up, hands up, that's you, hands up. Surrendering it all, surrendering it all, surrendering it all. If tonight you're also saying, I want to give my heart to Jesus, which means you want, you believe, or you know that you've sinned. You recognize you haven't been perfect as we all have. We've fallen short. And you're acknowledging tonight that you need a Savior. See, Jesus, he came to die for us while we were yet sinners, not before we got it all together. He didn't, he, uh, not, not after we got it together. Tonight, you can put your faith in Jesus. We can repent, turn from our old ways and turn to him tonight. By a show of hands, if that's you, if you want to receive Jesus in your heart, that at the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three, raise your hands all over this room. You're saying, that's me. That's me. I see your hand. I see your hands. I see your hand. I see your hand. Listen, if you're ready to surrender everything, if tonight's that night where you're ready to surrender it all, if you raise your hand for any of those calls tonight, I want you to make a step of faith and I want you to come out of your seat and I want you to come up to this altar and stand in agreement with people. We're gonna pray with you. We're gonna believe with you. We're gonna stand in the gap with you. If you raise your hand tonight for any one of those two calls, come on up, come on up, come on up, come on up, come on up. that came up tonight they're still coming up everyone that came up tonight I want I want you guys to know something that there's nothing there's nothing to be ashamed of standing up here at this altar your life matters so much to the Lord that that Jesus willingly put himself on the cross to die for you to give you a new start and even though it may feel, even though it feels like when you stumble or when you fall, it feels like God loves you less. I want, to, I want you to know this. There's nothing you can do to change how much God loves you. Nothing. Tonight, we surrender everything into the hands of God. We give him a whole life. We hold nothing back. We let it all go and we trust him with our heart and our life forever and ever there's someone in front of you that's going to be praying with you someone around you right now they're going to pray with you but they're also going to encourage you to take your next step it all starts with the class called starting at the way well you'll learn how to grow you'll learn how to how to be devoted to god you'll learn how to fight in your battles you'll be baptized you'll grow and you'll never be the same again don't leave tonight without making a commitment and going all the way in. Let's not stay on the shallow end. Let's dive all the way in. We need that desperate faith. We're willing to give everything up. Who's ready to jump in all the way in? 
Come on, who's ready to jump all the way in tonight? Every head bowed and every eye closed. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I surrender everything. Just sit there, just sit there, just sit there. Say, God, I surrender. Say, God, I give you everything. Thank you for accepting me, for loving me. I put my faith in you, Jesus. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the dead to give me a new life, to give me a new start. My faith is in you. I trust you, God. Forgive me of all my sin. Wash me clean. Fill me with your spirit, with your thoughts, with your heart. Give me your strength to live for you. My life is yours, and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen.